Hello, and welcome to Cats Week. I'm Annalise Poorman. At their November 4th meeting, the Monroe County Election Board met to discuss the ongoing debate over voting space allocation. Commissioner's Administrator Angie Purdy spoke on behalf of the commissioners, who she said were unable to attend this meeting. She asked for the total amount of space that the Election Board will need for voting locations and storage. Board member Hal Turner asked for clarification on what exactly the commissioners would like to be reported to them. The report that you're awaiting from the Board of Elections is the summary of what buildings we feel are required and what space would be allocated to those buildings. Purdy responded and explained the commissioners' questions for the election board. The understanding is that you guys were going to respond to the commissioner's request and to the commissioner's report about um, possible space. Okay, so yeah, about possible sites that they've made available um, to you guys. Um, and they want to know what functions and how much space you need specifically for a function. They don't want you to look at a building and, and fill it, right? They want that you to tell them what, how much space you need um, and, to do a function, and okay. then um, and then if you want, then it might be appropriate for you to say, this is a function we believe could be done, say, in the Napa building, or this is a function we, that could be done in the um, uh, showers building or something of that nature. The next meeting to address plans for voting in Monroe County will be held on December 2nd. At the Monroe County Solid Waste Management District Board meeting on November 4th, board member Isabel Piedmont-Smith asked about the landfill investments in German American Bank that she said were bleeding significantly. Executive Director at Monroe County Solid Waste Management District Tom Glasson replied. It's not been performing well this year. Um, and I, in our discussions with uh, with the bank representatives earlier in the years, you know, a lot of that has to do just with the market conditions and um, fluctuations and the limitations of our investment opportunities. But we can certainly reach out to them again and and kind of reassess the portfolio and see if there's changes that uh, you know that can be made to help improve the performance. Board member Cheryl Munson said it could be due to inflation. McGlasson said he would follow up with the bank. Later, McGlasson also shared that the Waste Management District used to have a prescription medication drop-off. However, they did not have the proper training to do so. Therefore, they only accept over-the-counter medication now. He shared alternative locations where residents can drop off prescription medications. For the information of, of, of the board and, and whoever is watching um, for for prescription medications uh, the drop off some that I'm available of are the sheriff's department uh, Bloomington Hospital and the CVS pharmacy that's over by Best Buy that's open 24 hours a third in the bypass third in College Mall Road Munson added that Monroe Hospital also collects prescription medication. The next Solid Waste Management District meeting will be on December 9th. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. I'm at risk of thinking there's just no point in trying. risk of looking in the mirror and hating what I see. I'm at risk of regretting what I do just to join the crowd. I'm at risk of being told not to tell. And you would never know it by looking at me. But with Girls Inc. in my corner, there for me every day. Believing in me. Showing me what's possible. I can be strong enough to respect myself and my body. To say I can rather than I can't. To say no with no apology. To be a leader. To finish school. 
To own my future. To break the cycle. Girls Inc. believes every girl can succeed. That's why the trained professionals of Girls Inc. are there for our girls every day, supporting, mentoring, and guiding them in a safe, girls-only environment, building bonds that last for years and change that lasts a lifetime. Girls Inc. gives girls the tools they need to boldly face challenges, to resist peer pressure, to be the first in their families to go to college, to beat the odds. With Girls Inc. in her corner, every girl can be healthy, confident, and resilient. She'll do more than dream about her potential. She'll reach it. With you in my corner. With you in my corner, I will not be another statistic. I will fight for myself. For my future. With you in my corner, I will win. Fuel her fire and she will change the world. Girls Inc. Inspiring all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. Welcome back to Cats Week. On November 4th, the Ellettsville Plan Commission revisited resident Kevin Ferris's petition to rezone his property to C3 to support his storage business. The council had postponed a decision at the last meeting to ensure the petitioner could attend the meeting and could advocate for his case. Commissioner Don Calvert expressed concern that if this is rezoned now, the property could be sold to someone else in the future. Once it is rezoned C3, then the Plan Commission could not stop alternative development that they do not approve of. Ferris assured the Commission that he has no plans of selling the property, and after he is gone, his sons will own it. Committee President David Drake responded, saying he did not think asking these what-if questions was an efficient use of time. We can speculate till the cows come home about what could go in there just as we could with anything else that is zoned as, as C3. Um, our uh, planning director has recommended that it be C3 um, and I, I think like the other Kevin said, I mean everything he's done so far has been extremely well done so I don't know that this is really the hill that we want to die on and all of a sudden start to to make uh, make things quite that specific for just a, a, a rezone. That's just my opinion. The plan commission voted unanimously to recommend the rezoning to the town council. The next plan commission meeting will be held on December 2nd. On November 3rd, the Bloomington City Council heard from the Director of Housing and Neighborhood Development, John Zodi, as he presented the Hand Department Housing Report. So some challenges with rental housing uh, right now. 60% uh, of rental households in Monroe County are cost burdened, which means they spend um, more than 30% of their monthly income on housing. Um, we are the most uh, cost burdened uh, metro area in the state when it comes to rental housing. This is from Prosperity Indiana. Many of you may know that organization statewide. A wealth of information on housing. So if you ever need that information, we're glad to hook you up with them and, and uh, they can share their information. They presented to uh, the County Affordable Housing Advisory Commission last month. And uh, we've gathered some of that information uh, from that and, and are sharing it with you tonight. And the eviction rate in Monroe County is um, about three per 100 households, which is lower than some surrounding counties, but still pretty average in the region. Um, and the third challenge, and there are obviously more challenges, but three to sort of talk about here, uh, a third one being the impacts of Senate Rule Act 148. That was the uh, piece of legislation that the governor signed into law earlier this year that put more regulations around the landlord-tenant relationship and what the city or government could or couldn't do to regulate that relationship. So when we talk about tenants' rights and responsibilities and things that we're able to do, to interact with our landlords and tenants. Um, that was 
that was pulled back by the General Assembly a little bit. So it makes our job a little more difficult, especially when it comes to communication. Zodi shared that there were 537 households in Monroe County that received rental assistance in 2021 as of November 1st. Later, Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator Mallory Rickbile gave a presentation on sidewalk equity improvements in Bloomington. So I have a theory, and the theory is, is that if you want to know the extent to which a community values inclusivity and accessibility in their transportation network, uh, you should simply look at the ground. Um, sidewalks or the network of sidewalks, um, they have the potential to connect a seemingly infinite number of people uh, to wherever they go or want to go um, at any time um, for a time period that could last generations. And, um, and so when a community invests in sidewalks, this transportation network, they're not just investing in concrete and right of way and design, they're investing in the agency of their residents to carry out the business of their lives, um, to explore the world with their senses, to connect with one another. Um, this is especially true for residents who have experienced systematic underinvestment or those needs who are not met through a traditional transportation approach. Rick Bile shared a spatial equity analysis that the Planning and Transportation Department completed, which revealed that certain demographics were underprioritized. The spatial equity analysis, uh, we, did, we did a spatial equity analysis, which is a tool through uh, the Equity Justice Project and uh, we put in 20 years of sidewalk funding, uh, sidewalk projects that have come through that spreadsheet. And we found that um, disproportionately, um, their sidewalk projects were clustered in areas that were underrepresented by unemployed residents. And there was an overrepresentation of uh, senior residents. We then, um, to test our variable, about the uh, request-based system, um, we put, we just chose 100 locations from the demand data that I will soon show you in order to test how that fared in the spatial equity tool. And you will see that, um, system, you see that this is now much more in favor of um, low income, extremely low income renters and cost burden households. The next city council meeting will be held on November 10th. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. For hurting families in Monroe County. A contribution to, to children who are vulnerable and in need of an advocate a staff that goes above and beyond to support and advocate for children in need of services. The web of remarkable people who are dealing with difficult situations. So many young people that uh, are in need of help and trying to find a stable family, a stable place to live. Without uh, the CASAs to, to make that happen, many of them would be unable to find a good home. I love being that voice for the child who can't speak for themselves in court. It takes me out of my comfort zone and it also helps others. CASA means supporting our community. Being a CASA is making sure that your village is healthy and whole and that the children in your village will someday be able to help the village as well. A child who doesn't have a voice, maybe in their family situation or a school situation, now has a voice that can advocate for them. I really enjoy working with children that are going through difficult times and letting them know that I care about their future. We are privileged with our charge of representing the best interest of children. And so therefore we can advocate for exactly what they need without restriction, focusing on their best interest. I want to repair the world one child at a time. Welcome back to Cats Week. 
At the Monroe County Commissioners meeting on November 3rd, the commissioners heard recommendations on precinct and district boundaries. During public comment, Monroe County voter Ruth Ike voiced strong support for Monroe County Clerk Nicole Brown. I want to voice my appreciation and strong support for the unwavering dedication and leadership of Clerk Brown. I have seen Clerk Brown do everything in her power to ensure that all Monroe County voters can safely cast their ballots and to ensure that every ballot is handled and counted properly. She has done this in the face of many hurdles, some foreseeable and some not. I thank Clerk Brown for communicating to the commissioners what is needed to conduct upcoming elections in accordance with best practices. While I understand that you have multiple issues on your plates, I, I urge you to prioritize Clerk Brown's request so that the fundamental right to vote and to have confidence in the election results can be assured without requiring superhuman efforts on the part of Clerk Brown and her staff. County Attorney Jeff Cockerell shared what the Precinct and District Boundary Advisory Committee discussed at their last meeting. This committee started meeting, uh, it seems like yesterday, but it's been a, a probably about a month now. And so we've they've looked at the precincts as they are, they've looked at uh, what's non-contiguous and they've looked at um, annexation items. And so I kind of will go through what they've recommended as far as a current precinct change. I will also let you know that they um, have voted to recommend that uh, because we've had such a short timeline that a, a precinct committee um, with uh, two members from each major party um, be reestablished in for the changes for the election in 2024. Um, so that, you know, they've scratched the surface. I think they were looking at issues and given that the state wanted these changes by next Friday, um, they didn't have time to do all the work again. We knew this was a compressed schedule. It was, it was a six month pro project that, you know, essentially got narrowed down to six weeks at best. Commissioner Julie Thomas said for the public's understanding that all of this is running late because of the census delays, which were pushed back because of COVID-19. Cockrell said that the committee recommended changes mainly based on geographical changes over years and to accommodate anomaly situations, such as one instance where the boundary runs through a building and half the residents would have to vote in one district and the other half in another. He also shared a recommendation that would change the location where the residents would vote. This is a much more interesting one, in my opinion. This item was in Perry 4, which is non-contiguous. It was put in Perry 4 because that used to be the state house line. And so the thought was to move it from Perry 4, which is non-contiguous county uh, uh, precinct, to Perry 23, which would then be a contiguous uh, Perry or a contiguous uh, precinct, uh, is the recommendation. The voting site will change for this, but it will change to a area that is actually closer to where these people live. I think they they will go to. Jackson Creek Middle School. The commissioners will make a final vote on precinct and district boundaries next week at their regular meeting. At the COVID-19 press conference on October 29th, Indiana University President Pamela Witten spoke thanking everyone involved in helping students to get back to in-person activities. I really would also like to take a second to thank all the extraordinarily dedicated healthcare workers um, who we all know have been and really remain on the front lines of the pandemic, as well as our many city and county partners, uh, really for, for your collaborative spirit. Uh, since the outset of the pandemic, uh, which feels like many decades ago, I know for most of us, um, IU's campuses have really been amongst the safest places in the state. But one of the lessons that we've learned uh, during the pandemic is really the degree to which all of us are interconnected. And, and our success, IU's success in weathering the pandemic could not have been accomplished uh, without the strong partnership that exists between the university, the city, and the county. Monroe County Health Department Director Penny Cottle explained when the COVID-19 health regulation extension would expire. 
the health regulation was extended this week and it is extended until our goal or the metric is met. And the goal has been the same since we put this particular regulation in place this summer. Nothing has really changed significantly in this regulation. So you may ask, well, what is that goal? It is reaching less than 50 cases per 100,000 residents, and that would put us at a moderate uh, level of transmission. And the county needs to be in an advisory level that is blue. Uh, it is possible to have one, but not both of those metrics. And so we do need both of them to be in place. The regulation as a reminder requires masks, regardless of your vaccination status, when you are in indoor public spaces. Um, and that stems from the CDC's recommendation this summer when Delta variant started surging, that everyone, regardless of their vaccination status, needed to be masked. She also said that although the mask mandate might end shortly, this is not the end of the pandemic. Individuals who have received the vaccine will not be required to wear a mask anymore. However, precautions should still be taken. Individuals who are unvaccinated are still recommended to wear a mask to protect themselves and those around them. President of IU Health Brian Shockney shared that the hospital is seeing a steep decline in COVID-19 cases. According to Shockney, Monroe County is doing better than other counties due to our mask mandate. I'd like to share our support of the Monroe County Health Department and community in the decision to continue the mask order until we are truly at a safe level of COVID cases in our community. While I recognize that masks uh, continue to be an inconvenience at times and we are all ready to get rid of those masks, I appreciate the intentionality to ensure we are removing the mandate at the right time to ensure we keep our community safe. And it is important to note that Monroe County is the only county in Indiana with a mask mandate, a county health order still in effect, and is leading many of our other counties in weekly progress and only one of and one of four counties leading the way in the positivity rate declines in this week's report on the State Department of Health website. IU Vice Provost of External Relations Kirk White said that on November 7th, students and faculty at IU will have the opportunity to get the Moderna vaccine or the flu shot or both. The vaccines will be free. He gave an update on IU's current vaccination rate and said the respective numbers of positive COVID-19 cases are an indicator that the vaccine is effective. Our vaccination rate has uh, continued to increase. You might remember last week we were at 93.7% and uh, this week we've moved up to 94.1%. At the same time, our cases of COVID has, have continued to decrease. So last week we had 25 cases. This week we only had 20. That's the lowest we've had all semester. So you see as the vaccination rate goes up, the infection rate goes down. And that is all for Cats Week. Thank you for joining us. For Cats and WFHB, I'm Annalise Poorman.